Shalom and welcome to Powers in Play, our uh, monthly program dealing with the global perspective of Israel's issues. And uh, next week we are marking here in Jerusalem the 75th birthday of the State of Israel. And we are trying to look at the state of play regarding the powers around, surrounding us, and what uh, evolved over the years from uh, the very beginning of the State of Israel to the present. With us are Reserve Colonel Miri Eisen, Brigadier General in the Reserves, Daron Gavish, and Reserve Colonel Dr. Eran Lerman, all experts in military and security with additional expertise in diplomacy, public affairs, and many other topics. Mary, let me start with you. I have um, some inside information regarding your holiday travels. <laughs> and I know for a fact that quite recently, during one of the holidays here, you visited along with your family an Ottoman relic. Um, and this brings to mind, um, if you can uh, speak about it uh, for a while, it will be uh, great. It brings to mind that uh, a mere century ago, a century and five, six years, the Ottoman Empire ruled this land. And then in late 1917, came the British Empire. It may still call itself an empire, now with the coronation, uh, but nevertheless, after 30 years, it felt too weak, had to leave. The United Nations voted on creating two states here. The Arab state did not come into being because Arab countries, along with the Arab population, fought Israel, only Israel was created. And then what happened was that the dominant power became the United States with the Soviet Union penetrating the area. And the rest is current history or more recent history. What's your perspective? Unbelievable to think that I walked just a little time ago on an Ottoman Hijazi railway. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about that Ottoman Hijazi railway, it reminds us that a little over 100 years ago, when we would walk around in this area, it was a railway that was built by the Germans who didn't want to pay the French, you forgot to mention the French, the French taxes through the um, port of Beirut, so that they actually built not a spur from Dera to Haifa, they built a new line from Haifa to Dera so that they'd be able to import the U.S.-made railways for the German railway that was being built to be the Hijazi railway, which is so important for the Muslim world. And that was just 120 years ago. Hijaz in Saudi Arabia. Hijaz in Saudi Arabia. Yeah. It, was supposed to be, it never did arrive at the end to Mecca, but it's a railway that existed from Istanbul down to Medina and that stop in Dera, which connected to Haifa. So look at where we are. We had Ottoman Turks, we had French, we had challenges. We had the Germans, we had challenges, building railways. And when I look in that sense of the perspective of the outer powers, you kind of segued into the United States and the Soviet Union. And at the end, we still need to remember that all of these outer powers in their new way of living in the 2020s of the century still have an impact in the area. The Turks still have an impact. The French still have an impact. The US certainly has an impact. Even Great Britain still has an impact in this arena here. And I think in that sense, it's something that we need to learn. Sometimes you may be the leader, but we don't actually have a lot who have left the arena. Iran, why did um, outside powers, not the Ottomans, the Ottomans uh, were here, but why did outside powers take an interest in our region? Now, the um, uh, Hijazi Railway and the TEP line, the Trans-Arabian Pipeline, these all indicate that there was oil here. Not here in Israel, but a bit oh. east of uh, our own uh, uh, country. Now, 
let me give you the taglines, the tag words. So it's petroleum, Suez Canal, perhaps right. India, the jewel exactly. in the crown. The Brit, uh, we, we tend to, for a very long time, when uh, in Israel, when you said great power interests, people uh, sniffed in uh, the, 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 the uh, were scent of oil. I mean, that was the assumption. It's all about oil. And oil was certainly very important. But for the British Empire, for example, who, as long as it was still an empire, until 1947, essentially, when they gave up uh, direct sovereignty in India, um, the Suez Canal was the key. It was the lifeline uh, of, of empire. And uh, even and, and therefore, when they came to Egypt to collect uh, debt in 1882, they ended up staying for 74 years until they finally left in 56 uh, in, in rather unpleasant uh, circumstances. Um, it was part of a, of a global strategic structure. Uh, then, of course, came first the Nazi challenge and then the Soviet challenge. And they had to be there or they had to be replaced by the United States as the mainstay of stability in the region in order not only to extract oil, but also to build a ring of containment around the challenge. And now we look towards the future and we are asking ourselves, how will the Chinese um, uh, Road, Belt and Road, BRI initiative of President Xi Jinping play out because in our region, because if you want to get from China to Europe via Central Asia, you ultimately end up uh, at the edges of the region. If you want to do it, as they call it, by the maritime Silk Road through the Indian Ocean, the Arabian Gulf, and, and up the uh, Red Sea, then uh, you'll directly uh, have an impact. And then the Indians are coming in with the Western Quad, as they call it, or I2U2, as we call it, uh, Israel, India, US, UAE. Um, the game is once again uh, afoot, as Sherlock would have said. Doron, the modern history of the Middle East probably starts with Napoleon at the end of the uh, 17th uh, century, the beginning of the 18th century, and then no, no. In, in mid- The end of the 18th, 18th beginning, beginning of the end of the 19th. 18th and the beginning of the 19th, and, okay. and probably centuries. in mid 19th century, with the discovery of oil reserves, the industrial age, uh, railways, um, there is um, a lot of impetus for foreign powers to get here. But technology changed so fast that now, um, in your involvement with American officers, for instance, um, when they look at bases, overflight rights, um, how they can project power, be it from aircraft carriers or submarines or um, cyber, what is the Middle East to them? When they look at the Middle East and we know they want to pivot to the Far East, um, and they are stuck in Europe because of the Russia-Ukraine war. They cannot just uh, relegate it to a secondary status. What do you hear from your colleagues? Well, I think that, uh, you know, looking from, from the United States uh, point of view, of course, this, the, the Mediterranean is still a very important uh, arena, although... As you know, and as we all know, we looked on the together here in this show on the national strategy of the United States and the different, uh, I would say, level of interest that they have in those areas. And we saw that uh, China more, Russia more, less uh, in this area. This is a very important uh, region for the United States. And, and you, are, you are fully right. It's not only about uh, the, about the oil. It's about being able to project the power. It's uh, being able to help their allies uh, from the United States uh, point of view within this uh, region. And uh, so this is still a, an important uh, arena for the United States. And uh, the technology is one of the enablers, uh, I would say, for, for them to be in this area. Military aid and uh, others, uh, it's also part of the game, but still important uh, area. 
I'm going to jump in and I'm going to be annoying and say, I do think it's all about the oil. I don't think it's about other things, but that's me. I'm old fashioned oil, gas, economy. I still think that the United States interest in this area is because of that. That's why they strongly still want to be within this area. This is not about cultural outreach. This is not about looking at the world in a different play. I think also part of it is against China. And again, it comes back mm -hmm. in that sense to that oil arena. So I, I, I greatly appreciate appreciate the idea, but I think that it does come down to things that are very practical in their own way. Now, by, by the way, you know, we are, we are now, we, Passover was like uh, two weeks ago, and uh, there is a question why Moses was walking with the Jewish nation for 40 years. And the real story is because he was walking all over the Middle East with his big stick, and he was looking for a solid place for the Jewish nation. And whenever we would go, we do with this stick, there was this black fluid coming out of the ground. And he said, this is not a good place to, to stay in. And then he came to Israel. He did like this. Nothing was on the ground. And here we are in Because, Israel, because so. oil and Jews Probably. do not mix. <laughs> <laughs> Probably did us a favor because we uh, but we're close to the flourished sea. some but, other ways. But Miri, um, the quest for oil has both an offensive and a defensive uh, dimension. Because yes, the United States, and especially the US Navy, needed oil. Therefore, they wanted oil from Saudi Arabia, from Iran, which was earlier a British uh, sort of protectorate, and the other uh, sheikdoms and, and oildoms of, of the Gulf. But the United States, during the Cold War, also wanted to stop the Soviet Union from invading Iran from the north and getting uh, its oil and perhaps threatening Saudi Arabia. This is no longer the case. Now, Iran is itself a power. It has uh, a relationship with Russia, the successor to the uh, Soviet Union. So the game um, has changed. It's changed, but let's look at different levels. There are regional powers and there are world powers. And I greatly appreciate the country that I am from and of, and that is Israel. And we are absolutely a regional power. I don't think of us as a world power. I don't think of as Iran as a world power. I think of Russia, and certainly Russia thinks of itself as a world power. So here I want to say in the powers in play of where we are right now, I'm going to put Russia and China and India that Iran mentioned and the US. And then I have to look at what is the EU as a power nowadays. Now just think of that transition in the last hundred and something years from the Ottoman Turkish speaking people who ruled all of the area that we're in into these different powers that are looking at it. And, and it is still a lot about the economy and it's about getting through, um, if you say oil or if you say the jewel in the crown, you need the Suez Canal to get through. Can any of us forget what happened when one ship blocked the Suez Canal. What was that for? Three weeks and the entire shipping of the entire world broke down just last year. So when we're looking at these different aspects still, um, it's different levels. I don't think that we have to look at all of them as um, world powers, but we're going to have regional powers in play and world powers in play. I think that mm -hmm. there are two different levels. You know, Iran, um, sometimes um, Israeli uh, politicians were accused of uh, leaking too many secrets. But compared to other places, uh, especially recently, uh, it's not that bad. Uh, some, if, even though it, it some may- Some contractor from Massachusetts. <laughs> yeah, it, um, it may have deterred some, some Arab leaders from having quote unquote secret conversations with their- <laughs> Uh, Israel, allies, is, yeah. Yes, with their uh, Israeli opposite numbers for fear that it uh, would leak. But, but there is uh, one topic on which there is heavy censorship in Israel, which uh, has rarely been broken. And this has to do what um, foreign documents reveal, and uh, we, we cannot uh, verify it, as Israel's quest for nuclear weapons and missiles. And the CIA files, which have been declassified, sometimes redacted, sometimes sanitized, but nevertheless, uh, show that in the 1960s, following agreements between Israel and France, Israel brought the MD-660 uh, missiles, uh, which the um, popular press likes to call Jericho. And that the range 
uh, had to do with Arab capitals in countries surrounding Israel. But that later on, when Menachem Begin took over, for some reason, the range was lengthened to cover the southern areas of the Soviet Union. Because if the Soviets threaten Israel or are about to help its enemies, the idea was, according to these publications, that Israel should have uh, some countervailing uh, uh, deterrent. Uh, after this long, too long introduction, hmm. should Israel consider those world powers helping its enemies as enemies too? Or should it see a difference, a distinction between these two classes of nations? Well, even during the Cold War, Israel never defined itself as an enemy of the Soviet Union. The, the Soviet Union for two great reasons of their own, chose to position itself as an enemy of Israel. They wanted inroads in the Arab world, and they could offer the Arab world what no American administration could offer, the destruction of the existing order and the destruction of Israel. Also, the, uh, after 67, the Jewish identity uh, outburst among Soviet Jews was a threat to the Soviet concept of the new Soviet man. Nationalities, uh, minorities. Uh, all of a sudden, the, uh, something was happening that, that uh, I think somebody, I think it was Martin Sharansky, said they were hit by a torpedo under the waterline because the Jews of the Soviet Union all of a sudden, sudden uh, were no longer that happy in their mm -hmm. homeland. And, and so for these reasons, they made themselves into our enemies. Israel never took that position. It was also always uh, careful not to be taken, to, to, for this to be taken too far. And as to the equations of deterrence, the, the beauty of the Israeli ambiguous deterrence is that it, not, it does not require Israel to be explicit in any way about who it is that needs to be deterred and under what conditions. And that is, I think, one of the benefits of this uh, situation which we undertook. You know, we have a position on this. We will not be the first to introduce nuclear weapons to the Middle East. And given that the Americans introduced them in the 1960s, this is a perfectly logical, meaningless statement. But beyond that... Um, but, but the, Ameri China, but the Americans in the, in the mid-60s made sure that the longer passage says the Arab-Israeli uh, portion of the Middle East. They were... But they had, they had uh, nuclear missiles, nuclear bombs in, uh, yeah. in uh, Saudi Arabia uh, in the 60s. The Americans did. They still have them in Inchia Lake, as everyone knows. And submarines. But beyond that, uh, should we think of China as our enemy because it is a friend of our enemies? I think not. Uh, but we do have a stake in the balancing... The, the power in Asia, and Israel is actively involved today in arming and, and uh, helping militarily a whole range of nations in Asia for which we have become very significant, from but India no. to Vietnam to the Philippines to Japan to Australia. So uh, this is the other side of the equation. But Iran, building uh, on what uh, Iran just said, the Israeli dependence on American assistance, some four billion, actually more, dollars a year uh, for uh, whatever time frame you want. Up to now, it's it's going to end soon, but nevertheless, it will probably be extended. And access to technology. Uh, leading edge technology, which Israel can neither produce at economy of scale nor um, purchase anywhere else. This makes Israel vulnerable to American insistence, not only as the American ambassadors used to put pressure on Israeli governments to build, to buy Boeing jets rather than Airbus, but to choose between the United States and China. Um, it's it's uh, all right, as, as Iran says, if uh, Israel can coexist with both of these world powers. But 
if forced to choose between the two, how can it behave? Well, I think that uh, first it's important to mention that uh, really the, the strategy of the United States when, when it uh, provides Israel with this uh, $4 billion dollars is what is called FMS. I mean, so this money would use Israel to buy uh, weapons and ammunitions and whatever within the United States. So yeah, they are helping us, but they are also helping their own uh, industries. This is, this is the United States strategy. It makes sense uh, for them. And a, a common Israeli helps. argument which <clears throat> makes us look very generous in being willing to accept American yeah. assistance. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. someone would say, would say also this. But, but you're right, there are advantages and disadvantages. Uh, I mean, even in the world that I'm coming from, just an example, the, the most of the, you know, Israel is being defended by a multi-tier uh, defense. Uh, we have uh, the Arrow 3, the Arrow 2, the David Sling, the Iron Dome, the different layers of defense of Israel. Three of those layers, the David Sling, the Arrow 2, and the T Arrow 3, were developed together with the United States. A lot of it, like almost 50% of it, it's U.S. Uh, money. And we are now in a situation uh, with Germany, because Germany wanted, uh, wants to buy the Arrow 3, and there is discussion between uh, Israel, Germany, and the United yeah. States, and the United States have a stand. They are saying yes or no. Uh, so for sure, we, are, we rely on that. Uh, so this might be kind of disadvantage, uh, but there are a lot of advantages coming with it. We, we are keeping, from a military point of view, uh, the quality of age uh, within the Middle East is well. We are still there. This is the, the, the QPR is still uh, there. QME. Uh, QP. Uh, so QME. it's uh, so it is still very uh, important. What, what, what does it mean that that Israel? For instance, uh, has the latest generation exactly. fighter plane, exactly. while while the others have a somewhat downgraded one. But does it mean that uh, it is going to deter them from from uh, starting from launching a war, or only that if war comes, um, our air force will probably shoot down most of their planes with uh, hardly ever losing a plane? It's, uh, first of all, of course, it is part of our deterrence. I mean, those again, Absolutely. these relations with the United States, this is part of Look the deterrence. Look at what we are doing with impunity in Syria. Yeah, the, it's part of the deterrence. Again, going back to the world that uh, I'm coming from, every two years we have a huge exercise together with the United States. The United States is enhancing the defense of Israel, but it's also part, we look at it more into the deterrence than other things. So I think from this point of view, we could also say those are the advantages, the returns, the, the how strong is Israel. And by the way, one, I would like to say that uh, we talked before about oil. We have to remember that we don't have oil, as we said before, and still the United States is our strong ally in the Mediterranean. So I don't think that they are looking only on oil. They have some uh, other interests here. And happily enough, we, we share interest between China and the United States. I personally and I don't have any doubts who we should uh, choose, and uh, I think we did uh, the right uh, decision. Ho and hopefully, uh, hopefully, uh, a billion and a half Chinese will come visit you soon, <laughs> and and I'm uh, not ask, sure we know how to handle to, that. <laughs> ask you to extrapolate. But let's yeah. piggyback for a moment on what Dolan was just saying right now, because as we look around us right now, we're going in between the security arena and the security relations oil within the economy and its impact. But as you just mentioned before, there are also additional aspects. And in that sense, I am actually not going to put it with an exclamation mark. I'm going to put it with a question mark. Here we are 75 years in. We've gone through a lot of different stages. We weren't always strategically aligned with the United States. And that doesn't mean that we don't share an enormous amount of common interests with them and common values with them. But we're not the 51st state of the United States. That doesn't mean that we always align one on one. And I think that when it comes to our own strategic interests in the powers in play, I appreciate the fact that we don't stand up and act as if we're the 51st state, that we do have additional complex relationships of all things with Putin in Russia, of all things with Xi in China, mm -hmm. with Japan, with all of the different countries that Iran was mentioning before, meaning you can be within the Middle East and there are all of these different interests and added on in. And I agree, the United yeah. States knows how to act on things that also are of their interests. But let's be clear, uh, Saudi Arabia is not exactly 
exactly a beacon of democracy to the West, and they have a very strong relationship with them because of oil. And they have a strong relationship with us because of other interests, and we are still a beacon of something in this area of the Eastern Mediterranean that we live in. And I like the different terminology. Are we in the Eastern Mediterranean or in Western Asia? Depends on who's looking at us at the moment. (laughs) Um, And I agree that right now that term of Middle East is too limiting to explain where we are for the powers in play. It's a relationship between the beacon and the bacon. Ah. (laughs) (laughs) Let let me say a couple of things. First of all, um, when I speak to Chinese friends, and they wonder how come Israel, for example, doesn't sell them even uh, you know uh, one piece of ammunition. We have a, we tried a in complete, the best. Uh, complete ban, uh, <laughs> sort of imposed or uh, requested by the imposed. United States. And people lost their jobs in high places in Israel when they uh, tried to play around with this. Um, the answer is fairly simple. If uh, one, if we are uh, the nation state of the Jewish people. If the other half of the Jewish people was living in China, we would have been in a different situation. But is to the Jewish people in the post-Holocaust era is Israeli and North American with some million and a half scattered elsewhere. And this very much determines the relationship. Um, you know, Ben-Gurion told the British in, in, uh, in 46, he was talking to Bevin and he says, there's going to be a, a kind of war between you and the Russians, and whether you like whether you like it or not. And we are going to be on your side, whether you like it or not. Why? Because my Jews in Russia, my Jews in Russia, have no voice. My Jews in America can speak. So it's not just uh, it's not just values and interests. It's also politics, and it makes all but the it difference. But it also means that if the Chinese in 20 years or so decide to impose a solution here, there will be no Jewish lobby in Beijing. Uh, I don't to, know if there is any kind of lobby them. in Beijing. Yeah. Maybe we should all start studying in that sense Mandarin to understand more. China has a woman a very, Darin, too. That's <laughs> China has a very unique view certainly of Western Asia and in that sense when you start well, they are before. respectful of us, you know why. Because we're as, both people as of one the, ancient nation to another, as a people the, of the five thousand years of history. Book. But Persia and Egypt too. Uh, I once had not? a conversation uh, with a Chinese official, and we talked about the United States. And what he did is this: that's let them wipe their mother's milk from their lips. I mean, this is a country yeah. of two hundred and something years. I mean, who are they? But we are considered uh, a, an ancient nation. Miri, um, Earlier, Daron brought up um, a nation whose name was taboo here 75 years ago, Germany. And there, there is um, a military, security, and diplomatic relationship between Israel and now United Germany used to be the Federal Republic of Germany because uh, Dada did not have any relations uh, with Israel. And um, Israel, uh, starting with Ben-Gurion and reparations, had a relationship with Germany, which in many respects helped Israel survive um, through very difficult years. Now, of course, Germany is a co-leader of the European Union. Israel um, has used its leverage on it regarding the Iranian uh, nuclear project and other, uh, in other respects. How do you view Germany in the galaxy of powers which Israel is facing? Germany has been in this area, as I said before, walking on the Hijazi Railway. I was walking on a German-made railway that was built there in the beginning of the 1900s. We have a tendency to look at it as if they weren't here. The Prussians were here. The Germans were here. You want to see a real monument of German power? Go to the church in Augusta, Victoria. Any of the churches yeah, here, here in Jerusalem. Of Kaiser, Wilhelm, Kaiser Wilhelm and his wife the three. playing Justinian. In the Byzantine but in that Empire. sense, Iran, you could say that here in the city of Jerusalem that we're sitting in, you can see the remnants of all of those amazing imperial powers pre-World War I. 
When I talk of Germany in 2023, it goes into the powers in play if I said regional and world. Germany is a world power as a country, and Germany is a world power as part of the EU, and Germany has a special relationship with Israel. Why do they have a special relationship with Israel? We could have a different program on that one. That one's going to be a hard one for us. But I think as I look into that right now, Germany in its, what are we now, third into fourth generation post-World War II, I do think that the Germans still have, including within that younger generation, a special understanding of the special religion um, relationship, as Iran put it, with the Jewish nation state. There is something that is exceptional there, and it will continue to be, and I'm not saying it's going to stay forever. But as that stands right now, it gives us a foot within the world of the EU, which is not the same in the rest of the EU, not in Great Britain and not in France, let alone in all of the other countries that make up the EU. Yeah, of course, we also have the Greek and Cypriot relationship, which also Which goes this way and that anchor, way. Anchors our position in Brussels, because everything in Brussels has to be done by consensus. And the Rome... Um, some 40, what was it, six, seven years ago, there was a famous incident in which the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General George Brown, was interviewed by a journalist of Israeli extraction, even though he lived in the United States for many years by that time. And the question put to General Brown was whether Israel was an asset or a burden from the American Hmm. military perspective, not the White House, not even the Pentagon, when you look at the civilian um, defense leadership, but from the military point of view. And General Brown fell into the trap and said that Israel, in many respects, is a burden more than an asset. Um, <laughs> the, the current chief of staff of the Air Force also a General Brown, who may be the next chairman of the Joint Chiefs, would probably give another answer That's if given the same question now, wouldn't he? Well, you know, working so close with the United States and, um, you know, now we are doing this shift between uh, Yukon to CENTCOM, and we do meet with the leadership of, uh, of Yukon and uh, CENTCOM, uh, we see a, a, a super strong uh, relations between the United States uh, and Israel. Uh, we don't see the politics over there. This is an operational uh, relations, very, very strong ones. And by the way, and again, I'm going for a second to my microcosmos as, as, a, as the previous air, air defense uh, commander. There is a lot of things that uh, other countries, including the United States, could look at us and, uh, you know what, humbly saying, learn. Uh, the Israeli defense, the multi-tier system defending, a uh, way of defending Israel, the interoperability within the different uh, systems, the defense of Israel, and those things that we are dealing with. In some extent, uh, we are the ones that are really inventing the will of, uh, in this area, but, but, and not only, by the way, but on the this question, area, but in the other. So, so from an operational point of view, I'm not talking about only the strategic, from the operational point of view, there's a lot to gain from, from, from this relationship. But the question in the mid-1970s, following the Yom Kippur War, the American airlift, and before peace with Egypt, the question had to do with the fact, at that time, that the relationship between Washington and Jerusalem, or as they used to say, Washington and Tel Aviv, had some negative effects on the relationship between the United States and moderate Arab countries. Now, of course, uh, this has all changed because we are on the same side. Well, Mia, the, this, the turning point is actually 1970, when Israel was willing to go to war to help an Arab regime survive against Soviet backed Black forces. September. Black yeah. September in Jordan. That was the point in which the Nixon and Kissinger administration began to see Israel at the highest strategic level as an asset. But for the military, it remained the burden. And it helped, a, it helped a lot that the Israeli ambassador at the time was General Itzhak Rabin. As, as his Sir. letter had always said, Lieutenant General Itzhak yeah, Rabin yeah. retired, and um, Nixon and Kissinger and Haig uh, revered him as a strategic as a line. commander. And, uh, but, but I agree that for many, many more years, the US military used to look of institutionally 
it began to change in the 80s with the Navy, then came the Air Force, and now I have, I'm hearing from people that it has permeated to the level of, compa of, of uh, company and platoon commanders. The U.S. military appreciates and, uh, and uh, let's say, supports the Israeli relationship. It's a um, two-way relationship. And it's, it's not a two-way relationship. relationship. Exactly. Yeah, look, nobody, nobody markets F-35s better than the Israeli Air Force using them for example, in, in anger, in action. Uh, and beyond that, um, if you look at the uh, American strategic uh, concept now, they no longer talk about uh, providing deterrence, they're talking about um, integrating. integrating deterrence. Now, the difference between UCOM and CENTCOM is quite simple. In UCOM, Israel was a significant but minor player. For CENTCOM, it is the most powerful military ally beyond the United States itself in the entire AOR, area of responsibility of CENTCOM. That makes all the difference. Nevertheless, they resented the fact, um, it's uh, now 40 years ago, that Israel drew in the Marines, which were then slaughtered in October in the Marine barracks uh, at the uh, Beirut uh, airport. But um, this question of, of um, an asset or a burden also has to do with Israel at one time threatening and perhaps still being of a nuisance value. Uh, Ariel Sharon was always quoted as saying, yes, the Arabs have the oil, but we have the match. Uh, and we can light up. Uh, so uh, this is the Madman uh, uh, theory. Hopefully, uh, Israel is looked at um, as, uh, as a stable nation with a stable, rational leadership, both civilian and military. When we look at each other, and we look at each other around the table we are very right stable. Now, <laughs> we feel ourselves both stable and both rational. We're all Israeli and we're all sitting right now in Jerusalem and we all understand that there isn't always rationality, including in ones that you would expect it, because at the end we are the Jewish nation state. And I think in that sense that it's not just a question of holding the match. It's a question of what would be the tinder, what would be what could light up. And in that sense, we may only only be a very strong regional power but we do have the capability to impact way beyond where we are. And that has to do with our relationship with the US and with China and with Turkey. It has to do with the relationship with Iran. And I'll just add here in that sense, when we look at the tinder and who's gonna be in that sense in the powers and play in the future, number wise, not a long time in the future, certainly Iran, even Egypt and Turkey will surpass Russia with the amount of people who live in each of their countries. Hmm. And if we're looking at superpowers, Russia is so enormous physically, but it actually doesn't have. But what, that what does amount. it mean, Indonesia and Nigeria, um, Brazil? Uh, yeah, you, it's also you about location, but it's also about location. Oh, and what they location, do. location, location. Hey, that's where we live. Uh, uh, talking about the match, it wasn't that long ago, 2010, that the Americans asked us to frighten the Chinese by our possible action on Iran into voting at least abstaining, they actually voted for sanctions on Iran. But, but Miri uh, brings up uh, a very valid point. Both yourself, as well as uh, Miri, came up uh, through the intelligence uh, core. And um, you're supposed to look into the future, um, <laughs> have a crystal ball. <laughs> yeah, exactly. um, and Carry it and, in the bag with me yes, all the time. And, there's a slight difference between the intelligence profession and prophecy. Okay. <laughs> no, no, but, but if, if you do it um, many years ahead, nobody is going uh, to uh, catch you at it. Can you assess and anticipate in five, ten years, not too long into the future, are there going to be um, world powers dealing or meddling in our region the way you mentioned France earlier. France came and went, of course. Uh, it had a foothold in Syria and Lebanon, Lebanon. and uh, actually was in friction with the British in 1948. And it helped um, forces in Israel 
not under the government, the Begin rather than Ben-Gurion. But France is no longer a major power here. It, it is perhaps in Iraq and in other places, but not here. It played a role, by the way, in the agreement now with, the, with Lebanon. Yes, that's, that's true. But <clears throat> looking ahead, uh, you mentioned uh, India and Iran and Brazil. Are there going to be major powers uh, which are not now on the map? Well, the U.S. will remain a key player. I, I would, and people tend to forget it's still the most prosperous great power on earth and growing remarkably well in recent years to the surprise of some people who are talking American declinism. But China is definitely coming in. It has already began, began to throw its diplomatic weight around and it will no long, be not long uh, until India feels obliged to come in because uh, it is the balancer. In, in Asia, and Israel is significant. In both. 10 seconds for each of you, Miri. I think that the China and India are looking to the future, but the US is still here. Uh, and uh, 10 years from now, when Donald Trump tries again and again <laughs> and again to be reelected. In, in, in the view of uh, challenging, uh, I would say, situation for us, I think that Iran is going to still be there, and uh, it will be a challenge for us for, for the last next years. Reserve General Doron Gavish, Reserve Colonels and Dr. Aran Lerman and Mir Eisen, thank you very much. And we will be back next month with another edition of Powers in Play here on TV7 News Israel. Shalom.